authors, filmmakers, entertainment, and all your listening needs. Listen now to Talk Now Radio, where no topic is taboo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. I meant to mention that Talk Now Radio is also listener-supported radio, and as I like to say, where no topic is taboo, and your support helps keep it that way by keeping us censorship-free. So, today, we're going to be talking to Jim Stacy. and before we get started, I'd like to mention that if you want to call in, the number's, <clears throat> pardon me, I think it's the rain in the air, is 832-632-7904. And if you want to learn more about Jim Stacy, and the book we're going to be talking about that he's written is Jesus is not a, uh, Was Not a Christian, you can reach him at uh, HTTP, the divine is within us. Matter of fact, you could probably just put www, the divine is within us dot com. He's got an interesting website. It's got quite a bit of information. I think you'll enjoy it. If you're interested in the book during the show, scroll down below the chat room and look at his description, his picture, the, about the guest, about the book, and right under that, you'll see a link to Amazon where you can purchase the book. If y'all do the link and get the book through my site, um, I get a commission on that, and that also helps support the show. Just if you don't mind my little miniature plug there real quick. So, Jim, how are you doing today? I'm great, Royce. It's good to talk with you. How's everything in down in Texas? It is wet. How about where you're at? Where are you at anyway? uh, Southern Michigan. It's uh, kind of partly sunny, partly cloudy today, but... You know, like they say in a lot of states, wait five minutes, probably change. <laughs> That's what they say here in Houston. I was going to thought- ask you, though, now that you mentioned the weather, uh, is the weather down, been down there in Michigan like it has here this summer, uh, like uh, raining all through spring and all through summer? Well, it's been interesting. I'm, uh, there hasn't been any real patterns to follow, but the other day we got hit with a really long, hard rainstorm. We, we needed the moisture, so it's been a little dry and, and uh, a little wet, but uh, pretty typical, I think, for Michigan summer. Um, well, here it's been weird. That's why I asked. I was wondering if we was the only one getting weird weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of people are, but part of that uh, you know climate change thing that people talk about. So, Yeah, that... Um Global warming, I think, is fixing to turn into global cooling over the next 10, 20 years. Well, I, ho- I hope not, but uh, we'll, we'll see, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, coming around to your book, Jesus is Not a Christian, I think you might want to maybe start out with telling everybody a little about yourself and what motivated you to write this kind of a book. And it's uh, got a rather unusual title, so you might help uh, people understand what you meant by that. <laughs> okay. Well, I was born in uh, the flat cornlands of Illinois and raised in the fundamentalist segments of Christianity. And there I had a very interesting childhood, uh, a childhood of abuse and a few other things. But I kept looking at all the men, for example, in, in church, and I knew them through the week, and I saw them acting one way, and then I saw them look, looking and acting totally different on Sunday. And I kept wondering, why is this? What is What's the difference in these men that that just are so different and and they're not living what they claim to to believe? So I spent many years looking at that the contradictions and what I felt was a a lot of hypocrisy. I kept reading and hearing you know some of the things that Jesus taught, and then I would see patterns that are different than that. And one day I realized, woke up and and said, "Wait a minute! <clears throat> On one hand, you have Jesus." On the other hand, you have Christianity. On one hand, you have Jesus. On the other hand, you have good old St. Paul. And I saw that so many people loved St. Paul with his lists of sins, his lists of bad people, and all these things that Jesus never taught. I said, wait a minute, I've got to do some investigation on this. So I spent many years uh, reading hundreds of books and preparing to write what I wasn't planning at first, but one day it came to that. Okay. Now, in reading your description, I see here that you were an active, ordained Christian minister for over 19 years. Right. So you know that you know Christianity pretty much inside out. And in fact, I myself was a fundamentalist uh, Pentecostal Sunday school teacher at one point in time, and I don't 
I got away from the church as well. Yes. Yes, but, I am. I spent, uh, yes, I most of my life in the church, and then I went away to Chicago and studied, uh, got, had three years of, of, uh, you know, the fundamentalist theolo- theological school. And, uh, but later I got my, a, a uh, undergrad degree at Eastern Michigan University. I have a master's degree in the, in the, the Christian theology. And then later I started studying the Aramaic language. That was my first intensive when I started my doctoral studies in California. So basically, though, at one point, after you became a minister, after all these years of questioning everything, you did finally come to a point to where you had to say, I'm not getting my fulfillment here. I need to look for a different source. Is that pretty much what happened? Uh, yes, you're right on, Royce, because in the church, I... You know, I went there thinking somehow well, maybe God would love me more if I was a minister, which you know, totally was not the case. And I realized when I got into that first little church that there was so much confusion and so much uh, bickering and backfighting and all kind of things. And so I spent a couple of years you know, with my ba- uh, bags packed, mentally at least, because they were trying to throw me out. I wasn't... Uh, uh, I wasn't preaching hellfire like these Baptists wanted, and so <laughs> so they uh, they tried to kick me out of uh, two or three of them. And the guy that was leading the charge, uh, after a year and a half, one day uh, he had a heart attack in the morning service and he died right there in church. And it was uh, kind of a sign to people, and a bunch of more people left. And then I stayed for another you know five or six years, and. What I found, Royce, was even there speaking to standing room only groups almost every week, there was something missing for me. And I said, I can't stay with this. I can't be with it. There's something more, and I've got to find it. So I left. So did you find it? Yes, I have. I found it when I began studying the Aramaic language, which is Jesus, or Yeshua, Jesus' native tongue. There was no healing for me ever from all the pain in the, the theology of Christianity. Theology cannot heal. Beliefs cannot heal. They just cover over things. But when I began to study the Aramaic language, and when I first began to hear what Jesus really said, I picked up a book one day in the home of a friend. It was called Prayers of the Cosmos. And the author of that book, uh, Aramaic scholar, became my Aramaic mentor as I studied, started my doctoral pro- program. And when I picked up that book and I read the Aramaic Lord's Prayer, Royce, I'm telling you, I felt so deep inside that some healing had started, that I had heard him for the very first time. And I I just absolutely was thrilled by it. And I pursued that. And I continue to do that. The healing and the beauty is found in the Aramaic language. I have never learned Aramaic myself, but isn't there a place where you can find the uh, these Aramaic prayers and Aramaic teachings where they've been translated into English, or maybe there's some books out about it? Maybe you wrote one? I haven't written about it. I'm not an Aramaic scholar for uh, translating and writing, but I've studied the Aramaic language now for 14 years, and what I have studied is the meanings of the Aramaic, how to apply them, how to live them. And one thing is very, very clear, the transpersonal psychology of the Aramaic, it's not for the head. The Aramaic language is for uh, owning it, for embodying it, and living it. And I, I have just been, my life has been totally transformed and changed as I've learned to really just walk my talk, be what I claim, be what I talk about. And the Aramaic is just that heart language that, when we embody it, and, and for example, when we choose to embody the unconditional love that Yeshua talked about, we choose to embody this birthing of a new self that he talked about. We choose to own our shadow stuff. Be born and, again. Well, that's what the church turned it into. And what, uh, what Yeshua said was, you must give birth to a new self continuously. But the church turned it into a theological, you must be born again. And theology can't give birth to anything, just beliefs. Well, so, you know, when I read that be born again, what I really perceived from that 
was uh, a, a life transformation, uh, like becoming an entire new person, like you were when you were born. Mm-hmm. But you're really you're just canning everything you've learned and becoming this whole new thing with a whole new experience. In other words, exactly. Now, exactly. Maybe that's not what most people get out of the theological reading. But that's what I managed to. Do. <laughs> well, that's great. That's that's a gift because you're right on. Uh, you know, when when Yeshua said, "The kingdom of heaven is within you," he meant that. And I have several questions that I've asked a lot of preachers over the years, and the truth is, not one minister yet has been able to answer any one of these four questions. And only one time, an elderly woman spoke up, and she knew the answer. I thought, now isn't that interesting? But for, if I can give you these questions, the first I was one, hoping you would. <laughs> The, the first one is, what is the kingdom, this kingdom of heaven? And the preachers normally say, well, it's, uh, you know, it, it's the church. I say, excuse me, the church was not even in existence when Jesus said this, when he talked about the kingdom. So I said, where is this kingdom? Well, it, it's, it's up in heaven, usually is what ought to hear. No, I'm sorry. Jesus said it is here now, spread out on the earth. It is among you. And so, again, they didn't have a clue. So then I said, well, where, or who, or where, where did Jesus say it was? And they don't know. I said, well, check out Luke 17, 21. The kingdom of heaven is within you. I said, now the next question. <laughs> Since the kingdom of heaven is within, and most of the time Jesus was talking about entering the kingdom, who would who wouldn't, who was having a hard time doing it. You know, those attached to their riches would have a very difficult time. The, he said the prostitutes and the and the, the harlots and, and the tax collectors are going to enter this kingdom before you, the Pharisees. And he had a lot to say about entering. Because so, theological beliefs have trouble getting into this kingdom. That's exactly right. So my next question was, if the kingdom of heaven is within you, as he said, how do you enter what is already within you? And I get this look on their faces of, holy cow, I don't know. And so, and that's been my, my quest, is how do I know? Because actually in the Aramaic, the word Malkuta, Malkuta, excuse me, Malkuta da Shemaya, what he really said is the queendom of heaven is within you. Malkuta is a feminine noun. And I mean, that shakes a lot of people up. What do you mean feminine? <laughs> so, but what I'm saying is the first word of the, of the Aramaic Lord's Prayer is not our Father. Jesus never referred to the divine as masculine only. He said, Avun devash maya nethkadi shemak tete malkuta. O birthing one, Mother and Father of all life everywhere. Focus the light of your divinity within us and help us make use of it. Now that changed everything for me. Well, I would imagine it would me too. But it does, um, you know, coincide with um, the way energy works. In other words, energy has to be grounded, for example. Exactly. Kind of, kind of like the masculine needs to be grounded by the feminine or, or vice versa. Right. I'm not About, sure which order that should be in. <laughs> I don't think there is an order, Royce. I think it's it's a balance. Uh, I've talked to a lot of men, and I've said to many of them, you know, guys, instead of this get or done thing and this tough men are the, we, men are the stronger sex thing, I, in fact, in my 10-book series, which I haven't told you about, I, uh, I've, I've written and I'm getting getting those finished, one of the volumes is called Men as the Weaker Sex those who create religion for the sake of control. So, anyway, when I talk to men, I say, guys, you know, we have a, a, a masculine side and we have a feminine side. When is a man tough enough to access his feminine side? When is he tough enough to be gentle and kind? When is he tough enough to include everyone else instead of fighting and quarreling? It changes everything. Well, yeah, one of the big things the church is uh, into theologically is the uh, the more masculine energy. That's why everything, you know, downplays the women and upplays the men, in other words. 
Yes, and I'm a strong, very strong supporter of the feminine. We need we need both, but we need them we need them in balance, as you were saying. And yet, you know, Jesus embodied the feminine energies of healing, and nurturing, of loving, and the, probably the one of the biggest ones is seen in Proverbs eight and nine, where wisdom is is, is referred to as she. And, but to include everyone at the table of the divine is one of the most powerful energies anyone can embody. And of course, Jesus was accused of being, oh, you know, you're a friend of the publicans and the sinners. You're, you're drinking wine with them at the local pub. And he said, yes, I am. And uh, he included everyone as part of the divine because he saw that the kingdom of heaven, the queendom of heaven, was in every one of those people, even though they were not aware of it. Well, also, though, I know that in some of the ancient extra-biblical works, wisdom is termed as Sophia, which is a feminine term. Yes. Um, what about Aramaic do the, in that language? Did they also uh, use the word Sophia for wisdom? They, it's, it's similar. It's Malkuta is the word for queendom. And, but sacred wisdom or holy wisdom has always been feminine. The sacred breath, for example, and th- th- this is huge. The, <laughs> this is where the church really messed up because <clears throat> when Jesus talked about the, the Holy Spirit, he was not talking about a third male person of a fabricated trinity. He was saying something far different. The, the Sophia, the divine Sophia, the sacred Numa is feminine. The breath of the divine, the breath of the male-female divine is part of the experience of, be, of knowing this kingdom and queendom within. But yes, wisdom has always been, for by many of the ancients, referred to as feminine. So when are we as men tough enough to access the energy is of wisdom, not the know-it-all, uh, typical know-it-all masculine energy. Well, I think another question might also be, how would we as men, especially newcomers, unfamiliar with this doctrine, would they incorporate this phys- uh, feminine? Mm-hmm. How do they incorporate it? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, they do some, some study and some work, and they, they find out what it's all about. And once they understand that there is the male and the female, there is the kingdom and the queendom, there is this energy of inclusion. But we can, in our prayer and meditation or whatever we we, we practice, we can say, oh, I need some help here. And for me, the word, the prayer thank you is the only prayer we ever need. To say thank you to the divine. Show me what I need to know about the divine feminine. Show me what I need to know about sacred wisdom. If you, if anyone makes those requests, I guarantee you their doors are open and their life is headed for absolute beauty and transformation. That's the key to ask for it. Okay. Now, the uh, some people will say that the doctrine, and I've seen this myself in the New Testament, is it's like it's a whole entire different God, a whole entire new religion, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. is the Old Testament. Would Mm -hmm. you say that the Old Testament is more in line with the Aramic teaching than the New Testament? I say neither one is, frankly. Neither one. I would tend to agree with you, but I wanted to hear you say it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, because the Old Testament, interesting that, what is that God all about? I mean, when you really look at it, when when people really read it, one of the glaring, and there's many of them. I have a book of 120 some different glaring contradictions that are found within the, the, the passages of the Bible. But I asked a, a couple of people recently, said, wait a minute, does your God, this Old Testament God, whatever, that was really quite genocidal, he was misog- misogynist, he was for slaughter and killing and murder and all these things, and he told his people, so-called people, to go out and do all these things. But I said, does that God also say in your Bible that it was not, it was, it was a sin to commit adultery? Oh, yes, 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 they say. I said, well, wait a minute. You go to Numbers 31, and there you find that same God directing his people to slaughter all the men, to slaughter the women, 
to slaughter the children and the babies. But he said, if and when you find these cute little girls that you would they really like, take them home with you. I said, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And, and they don't believe it's there until they look it up. And, and that, so, that would make that same God condoning pedophilia. <laughs> exactly. And, and condoning abuse, sexual abuse. And condoning the very things that the so-called Ten Commandments were supposed to be against. So, Jesus did not uh, believe in or understand or know at all this God of the Old Testament. He could not have, because he saw Avun, the first word of the Aramaic Lord's Prayer, O birthing one, you get mother and father of all that is. Jesus saw the divine as that beautiful, powerful, loving energies of both the beautiful masculine energy and the beautiful feminine energy. I tell people, if you don't like that, go back to Genesis 1 in your Bible, where the divine is saying, let us, us, not me, (laughs) let us create the human in our image. Male and female, they were created. Right there it is. Actually, though, if you go back into Genesis all the way to Genesis 1, Mm -hmm. when he creates uh, the Adam or creates the man, I don't have it right in front of me, I might be getting part of that backwards, but mm-hmm. the first cre- original creation, male and female created he them. Yes. Uh, and then you move on to Genesis 2. Mm-hmm. You got a recreation of Adam, but now you got Eve being pulled from Adam's rib. Yes. So now you got to go back into one and ask, what was this original male and female that was before Eve ever come around? And he uh-huh. created he, he them. Yes. Now, my thought is the original creation was a male-female creation in one. Exactly right. You are right on. And what happened, and history shows this, that the men got a hold of it. They didn't like the, the, the original creation story because they had to put the women down. So instead of seeing the beauty of the male and the female and the, the female being equal to and in balance and harmony with the masculine, oh, they turned her into a rib. That's terrible. Making it's her ab- subservient. Exactly. It's total. Un- it's not the truth. It's totally not what Yeshua believed or taught. And it, it's 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 terrible. Yeah, and a lot of people are unaware of the story of Lilith, where she was uh, wanted. They they was asked to become subservient and take the bottom position, and was rejected by Adam for refusing to do so. Mm-hmm. And where was that? It's extra, it's in Judaic sources. It's not part oh, yeah. of the Bible. Oh, oh I see. Yes. I, yes. You're right. And the women were, were made to be subservient in the minds of all these control freaks, the men, who <laughs> just are not happy unless they're in control. The shadow masculine, and that's, uh, that's one of the volumes in my 10 volume series that I'm calling a backpack for a spiritual journey. But the shadow masculine is one of the most damaging and harmful energies ever on this planet Earth. It elevates the man. It puts him in charge. And Paul was one of them who said, I mean, Jesus didn't say, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. No, Paul said that. And he's dead wrong. But that was his belief. In fact, he said in many places, he said, my gospel, my gospel, over and over he said that. He should have been saying what Jesus taught. But I wrote another book called Conversation of St. Paul, and it's, Jesus and Paul were vastly different, and Paul did not know him. He never quoted Jesus one time. He never, ever referred to anything that Jesus said, but he was a misogynist, and that was his biggest problem. Yeah, a lot of people have mentioned the fact that, uh, well, they believe that Paul's gospel was not actually uh meant for the Bible, it was a, um, what do you want to call that? Uh, that it was deliberately inserted for the purpose yeah. of changing church doctrine. Exactly right. I've, I know this history very well. I've studied it. I've read it. I've, I've looked at it. And I, I've, when I first came to see how people got their Bibles, for example, it was men, men putting this stuff together. <clears throat> then say, the best image I can say is, okay, you got a whole bunch of men sitting around a, a table, and on this table are piled thousands of manuscripts, 
thousands of letters, thousands of things that were written by human beings. And so they started taking a look. And this is what happened at the Council of Nicaea in 325 uh, A.D., or this common era. The Council of Nicaea looked at all of these things. And they said, oh, gee, we like this one, and no, we don't like that one. So we put this, we like this one, we'll put it over here. The, the other one, no, throw it in a pile, we're going to burn those. And we like this one, okay, put it over here, but no, we don't like this one. So they rejected most of them. And my question is why? The reason is they rejected everything that disagreed with what they'd already thought was the truth, their theology. I think a little more exactly, if you pardon a slight disagreement on my part, mm-hmm. is that that's not all they uh, left in there. I think they also left some of the uh, some of the true teachings, maybe reworded, but they left some of the true teachings in there because they were, you know, common knowledge of the time. Mm-hmm. If they, you know, took it out, it would look pretty bad, and yep. they couldn't exactly get rid of everything because they didn't know how many people had. Um, hidden records that would pop up later and bite them in the hiney, in other words. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Yes, I agree with you. And so they went on, and and they mixed it all up. And once they decided, well, these 27 books belong in the New Testament, but ah, other parts of the church had only 22, and other parts had 31. So... How do we was, account and answer for that one? <laughs> yeah. Well, it wasn't until a church council hundreds of years later they decided officially, no, nope, just these 27, and we're going to put them in a black book, leather, and fancy pages, and we're going to stamp gold letters on it to say the Holy Bible. Sorry, but it's nonsense. It's fabrication. Jesus would not have bought into that. Well, yeah, and also if you remember back in the early days of the church, they weren't allowing people to read the Bible. They had to get the... Uh, churches or the pastors and interpretation and in all honesty there wasn't a lot of people back then that knew how to read to read it anyway exactly and that was a strong suit of the church because for hundreds of years they kept the, the scriptures out of the hands of the people and we'd look back into history and people like um, uh, john Wycliffe, uh, who wanted to translate the uh, the scriptures into the language of the people that they killed him and they hated him so much, they later dug up his bones and burned his bones and threw them in the river because they did not want people to have the ability to read it. They were the authority. Well, yeah, they were actually <coughs> torturing anybody that would come up with a translation of the Bible just to make people afraid to come up with translations of the Bible. They they didn't want the word getting out. I mean, you know, because they were moving further, you know, westward, in other words, and the, more, the further they went, they didn't want the actual words of God spreading before they could, uh, you know, teach their side of the God doctrine, in other words. You got that exactly right. And what they did, uh, do you know about the Nag Hammadi Library? Do you know about that? Yeah, actually, I was going to mention that a, a couple of times when I heard you talking, mm-hmm. that I uh, moved on to something else that crossed my mind. Because <laughs> in the Nag Hammadi, Jesus actually um, favors Mary Magdalene. Yes, he does. Yes. And I, I think there's also other females that were, you know, used as the, uh, under some form of use to the, to the, uh, I guess you'd call it the mission rather than the church. That, yes. uh, you know, the, the church doctrine does not acknowledge all this in the main uh, canon, in other words. Not at all. Mary Magdalene was turned into a prostitute. She was never that. Never that. Mary Magdalene was sacred in in fact, in Jesus' circles, he did not have just 12 men disciples. He had women as well. And you go to southern France today, and I know people that have been there, and that's where Mary Magdalene went after the crucifixion. And there's a lot of evidence that she and Jesus had a child. And she spent the rest of her life in southern France healing people. The the Ren de Chateau. The, uh, the, the, the Rene le Chateau? Yeah. Yeah. Or well, it might be pronounced the way you pronounced it. I yeah. I get those names wrong a lot. <laughs> That's okay. Same place. It's a, the the chapel of the uh, the the cathedral or whatever of Mary Magdalene. And but you're right, Royce. When you br- you brought that up, Jesus honored the feminine. He was a sexual being, and he was human. He, his favorite name for himself was Son of Man, not Son of God. But the, when the church then burned all these these texts and threw them away and burned people at the stake too because they didn't want to surrender, uh, 
they burned and burned and burned. They, they burned the libraries of Alexandria, which cast the whole world into the Dark Ages, from which we have still not recovered, I believe. But they th- burned these texts. Uh, even the, one of the early church fathers, Irenaeus, he had all these books that he hated, and he had a 30-volume set himself called Against All Heresy. And the only reason we know what was in some of them is when he quoted them and then tried to refute it. But after burning and burning and burning, in 1945, way back when, some wise man, whoever this was, we don't know. Maybe it was a woman. I, I want to make sure that <laughs> it probably was a woman if I, you know, the wisdom in it. But someone took this collection of ancient scrolls and hid them in the cave in the Nag Hammadi region of Egypt three years before they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qumran. And we now have those in one volume. I've got it right here, and I've read it and studied it many times. The Nag is the, the Nag Hammadi. Hammadi is like a word for the creek or river but of that, e- that area of, of Egypt. But James Robinson and others were there, and they got these scrolls, and they've translated them into English. My favorite one is the Gospel of Thomas. Mine and, too. <laughs> and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is in there, and a few others. But you're right. Thanks. I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've read the Gospel of Thomas, and in my way of thinking, that is one of the most uh, scripturally written, I mean uh, spiritual would be a better word, uh, written Gospels I've read in a long time. Yes, absolutely. I love what he said so many times in there, and, and just... It just blew me away when I started reading it. Uh, some of the, the texts in the Nag Hammadi Library are, are really difficult to understand, but they are the collection of the early Gnostics, uh, those who knew, those who rejected theology and beliefs and practiced what Jesus taught. And so in the Gospel of Thomas, for example, there's no uh, record anything of, his, of Jesus' birth or, or his death, and there isn't in any of the other Gospels either except they were added to Matthew and Mark and Luke. But uh, the church did that. Made up stories just to, uh, in order to be able to fulfill prophecy. Uh, you know, they kind of made extracts from the Old Testament to the New to make, be able to make claims, in other words. Exactly. Yes, exactly right. It's, it's, they took what they wanted to believe and made it something else fit into that. They changed it and developed. They made Jesus to be that scapegoat. Uh, in the wilderness, they made Jesus to be a substitute for doing their own birthing of a new self is what happened. So they replaced Jesus and that really that tough work of giving birth to a new self continuously. They changed that into, oh, just believe this and you've got it. Uh, sorry, Charlie, but that is not the way it is. What they didn't do, though, is they didn't cover their tracks very good. I mean, uh, here in the Old Testament, you got God saying that uh, the sins of the father will not be visited to the son and so on and so on. But right. yet, in the New Testament, God's uh, visiting the sins of mankind onto Jesus. In the Old Testament, a man bore his own, own sins, in other words. Yeah. And, and yeah, to put all that on Jesus was totally the wrong thing to do. Totally wrong. But, you know, I'm sure you know, Royce, that it's so much easier to blame somebody else for for our badness instead of owning it and saying, I'm responsible to change this. Well, that's why they got a saying that says, the devil made me do it. <laughs> that's exactly right. And I remember, I've heard many people say, uh, in fact, when I first, my first book, you know, that my book came out, uh, Jesus was not a Christian. Somebody looked at, oh, my goodness, and uh, what what is this about? And I said, it's about, you know, how they pushed Jesus into the dust of history and replaced him with with these theology uh, theological beliefs and so we are I said we're responsible for ourselves and we have we're not we're responsible to live in a way of loving our ourselves our neighbors and our enemies and I said we are not doing that and this one person I remember very clearly looked at me and said well I'm not forgiven or I'm not perfect I'm just forgiven and walked away. And, and I'm right. like, do you really believe that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so easy to, to believe that. I'm forgiven. Uh, not perfect, so I, therefore that's an excuse. I'm just going to go on not being perfect, and I'll just keep getting forgiven over and over and over again. 
Jesus never taught that, ever. <laughs> Actually, Jesus taught, be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. <clears throat> yes, and yes, and be, be, you, be mature or perfect, be, be the one who embodies, is what that really says in the Aramaic. Be the one who embodies the truth, and the word perfect is unfortunate there in the English, I think. But it is be, be real, that's all he's saying. Well, yeah, because anybody reading the New Testament has no knowledge of Aramaic. They can right. only get the teaching of the church. They can't get the original. Yes, right. And though, though we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, whatever, the, uh, we don't know. Nobody has any, any records of the originals of those. However, there are today original Aramaic texts still available. And the Gospel of the Nazarenes is one of those. And there's others. Uh, I, I know another man, uh, he, he's a delightful Aramaic scholar. He, he lives in, in Finland, and uh, his name is Lars Moll, L-A-R-S-M-U-H-L. He has written some of the most powerful writings and, and, and re- re- revealing the Aramaic truth of any that I've ever seen. My Aramaic mentor was Dr. Neil uh, Douglas Klotz was his last name, a hyphenated last name. And Neil became my Aramaic mentor when I started my doctor studies. And he has done a huge amount of translation. And that's why I recommend uh, one of his early books, The Prayers of the Cosmos, by Neil Douglas Klotz on, on Amazon, and uh, where he gives these translations of the Aramaic Lord's Prayer, the Beatitudes, and even one that he translates with the three words, love your enemies. And it takes 11 lines of text to show how we project stuff onto the people and label them instead of doing our own work. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, love your enemies means turn them into what you want. <laughs> exactly. That's right. So I say if we stop labeling anybody as an enemy, we won't have any more. <laughs> now, my question on this is, and I've always wondered about this, if Jesus was a Jew, like uh-huh. the Bible says, if the Bible's even correct, I'm not saying it is, yeah. but if you go by that, why would he speak Aramaic instead of the ancient Hebrew language? Well, he knew the ancient Hebrew because the Hebrew and the Aramaic are very close, even when you see them written, it's they're very closely related. Aramaic was the the dialect of the of the Judea, the region where Jesus lived, and and taught and and where he he was. So, it's very they're very very close. Once you know one, it's easy to know the other one. But Jesus never embraced or supported any of the Old Testament. Uh, the the, uh, the scapegoat, the ideas of all this sin and this this garbage, and he never embraced the idea of being chosen. There's no word, for example, there's no word for sin in the Aramaic language. And there's no word for hell in the Aramaic language. Jesus never said either one. But Although the, the Bible shows him saying that that was uh, words put into his mouth by early church fathers. That's right. Well, even the Hebrew people, there's no word for hell in their language. They don't believe in that concept. But yet we find hell all through the Old Testament. The he- I, asked, I talked to two rabbis about this one day, and uh, they said, no, we didn't, it's not a reality in, in, our, in our world. So that was, again, put into uh, the, the, the text by the church. So did but, you ask the, uh, the people who spoke Aramaic or the uh, rabbis, either one, what their belief is about the afterlife? Well, I didn't on that day, uh, and I, I, I'm not even sure what that is. I don't want to speak about something that I don't know. But uh, it's not uh, like a lot of people think. But they, the, the Hebrew people, never have ever embraced the idea of punishment from the divine. Never. And even when, when uh, that day when uh, the people brought this blind, this man to Jesus, who he was born blind, I don't know exactly, I gave you the text, but uh, it's a well-known story. Yeah, and the, I'm, I'm familiar with that story. And because I've actually used that story, the one you're referring to, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. To explain how the Bible does in some ways, uh, hint the New Testament at reincarnation. Mm-hmm. 
Ah, that's, you know, I know the one good. you're talking about when I say that, don't you? Yes, I do. And yes, and that's a great clue. And but in that text that I was referring to is when the Pharisees said, well, "Who Jesus? Who sinned that this man would be punished like this and born this way?" And what did he say? No one. No one has sinned, but this is all for a much deeper purpose. <laughs> so, uh, and I even, even in the Greek, though, when it says all have sinned, that's Paul's stuff, but it's all have missed the mark. But, and that, and that's an archer's term, as you well know, that uh, an archer's shooting a, an arrow at a target and he misses. So, what does he do? Well, it's revealed in the, in the Aramaic, the word for sin is remoteness. In other words, standing in a place that's too far away from the divine. So the Aramaic says, what's the answer to that? Come closer. Warmer. Come clo- warmer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, you're getting warmer. <laughs> so we're all part of the divine. When when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you, you, you don't have a kingdom without the presence of a king or a queen. Queen. So, And what he taught, and the Aramaic so clear on this, you are the divine in human form. You are. The energy that you are, the light that you have, in fact. When Jesus said, you know, you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Oh, my, the Aramaic is so clear on this, that the light that Jesus was referring to is the the divine itself within us. We are the divine in human form. We are not born guilty. This idea of guilt and shame and punishment and and original sin, I know how original sin got developed. I know who did it. I know when they did it. And I know when the church started teaching it. It's all farce. It's not. It's just not the truth. I'd like to know that information. Well, have you heard of a man named Augustine? Uh, Augustine or Augustus? Augustine. The uh, not not the Roman ruler Augustus, but Augustine, Saint Augustine. Uh, I want to say that sounds vaguely familiar. Okay. Well, he's the guilty one because Augustine, in fact, there's a book called The Confessions of St. Saint Augustine, or Augustine, they call him, uh, whichever the word. But uh, but Augustine, I call him Discussing Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the one that gave birth to this idea that we're born wicked. And let me tell you why. Augustine was a man who just, you know, was part of the Roman Empire and he was in the church and he was just an ordinary, uh, person back in the, in, in the early days of his life. And, but what was true in the Roman Empire is that they were, had many, many brothels, uh, and, you know, whorehouses basically and, and places where prostitutes hung out. And it was Caligula that taxed the, the prostitution and it became a huge uh, revenue source for the Roman Empire. And so Augustine, or Augustine, he, he used to go to the Roman baths, and he, in his writings, he admits to having lots and lots of sex with the whores, the prostitutes, in the Roman Empire, and he couldn't stop doing it. He just loved sex. Well, okay, nothing wrong with that. But what he did over and over again, he he just couldn't control himself. And one of his famous prayers, <laughs> get this one. He was praying one day, and he said, Oh, Lord, help me to be chaste and continent, but not just yet. <laughs> In other words, help me be able to control myself and not be having sex all the time, but, but not just yet. So when he became older in his life, he had to have some excuse for his sexuality. And when he read that verse that Paul wrote, and he had a faulty Latin translation of it, and he said, the part that where Paul said, for by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, blah, blah, blah. He took that whole thing and twisted it. And he said, aha, I couldn't help it because I was born not being able to help it. And he called it original sin. Well, he loved the idea so much, he started writing about it. And here's the, here's the beginning. He said, we're not guilty. Uh, you know, we're just forgiven. The, the same thing. And he wrote about original sin. Later, Royce, he became the official theologian of the Roman Catholic Church. And though that happened in the four, late 4th, early 5th centuries, 
the Roman Catholic Church didn't even start teaching it as official doctrine until the ninth century. And from then on, everybody is born guilty and deserving fire before you take your first breath. That's the brief history. Now, the ninth century is really pretty much before the Catholic Church had I, what I would call myself uh, recognized competition. Now, when I say this, I'm talking about there's a difference in my books between their big war with the Protestants and the uh, little skirmishes they used to have with the Cathars and the Gnostics, in other words, etc. So well, up until mm-hmm. this here particular time, um, there's a uh, it, everything was going on. Um, well, what was I going to say? I had a, a thought, and when I went to explain the difference of what I was talking about, I lost the thought. I thought I was following you, and I lost you too. But I think, uh, yeah, back when, the, how did the church get started with the idea of original sin? When did it become officially taught? And but it was at the Council of Nicaea in 325 that all this stuff was developed. But then, and 600 years later, they began teaching original sin after Augustine invented it. But yes, and they spread this as the official doctrine uh, and put this shame and guilt on humanity. And I say without any reservation at all that the most harmful energy in the history of the world is the church's blame and shame and guilt and saying we are bad instead of saying what Jesus said. Well, myself, I've known a lot of people in church, and uh, I'm sure you're as well as I, where, as I am, that uh, you got some church that are downright friendly and Relative, uh, relatively, if not largely or mostly uh, harmless, uh, mm-hmm. that's really a, a nice place to socialize. Yeah. Right up to people where you got your uh, gun-toting homophobes that are uh, <laughs> zealots or uh, extremists, in other words. You, and you got the whole range, range in between. Yes, you so do. So what I'm getting at is I don't say anything against church per se as being a totally bad concept because that mm-hmm. would mean you'd have to uh, – you know, mark off your list or take the list of the good and throw it in with the bad and it don't belong there. Well, it's tough. Yeah, you're, I appreciate how you said that because I, I look at it this way. I see the Christian religion as being very negative and not very helpful at all in everything from the smallest little uh, you know, church in Kansas that, that demonstrates at all the funerals <laughs> and and than the biggest, one of the biggest mega churches anywhere you've got right down there in Texas. And I see the, the whole gamut, and I say, wait a minute. You, where is now, you're talking about here in Texas. We've got more than one big, huge mega church. Well, that's true. Joel Osteen, you got John Hagee. I'm sure you're referring to one of those, too. Yeah, good old Joel and good Joel and John, yeah. And they've both built God's house, and they, anyway, you know, I won't go there, but, <laughs> but in the religion of Christianity, you have all these extremes. And I say the mega church with rock bands and this and that and everything else is just as, as negative as the little church in Kansas that, where they go out and demonstrate against all these bad people that God hates. But here's the way I look at it. I see the Christian religion as very negative. But when I meet an individual Christian, whoever they are, from one extreme to the other, my job is to love them. My job is to honor them as a human being, irregardless of their beliefs, and that's what I really try to practice. And if I can't do that, then I'm not walking my talk. <clears throat> I may dislike and really have Just strong... Just got to remember that walk's not always easy. That's exactly it. Uh, I may really detest some of their beliefs, but as the human being, I have to say, wait a minute, Jesus said the kingdom, the queendom of heaven is within that person too. So my job is it's to in love. there. They just don't see it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, how long it took me to understand it, you know? So that's yeah, well, what I was going to say a minute ago, though, um, was while I do feel like some, not all these churches are, you know, totally bad. They're a good places to socialize. I don't really feel that any Christian organization or any monotheistic organization that I've seen or any of them that came from Abraham, in other words, mm-hmm. is actually a path to God that they understand the path to God, no matter how harmless they are, because mm-hmm. of their weak foundation and their doctrine and their teaching, they've all been misguided to one degree or another. And, you know, 
they're not seeking the, I don't know any of them that's seeking the kingdom of God within, like Jesus said to do, in other words. Yes. Well, that's because it's individual. And that's what my, I mean, I've taught a lot about this and written a lot about it and, and speaking about it. In fact, I'm now leading vision quests in the Arizona desert. Um, and people can find out about that by going to my website or, or if I can mention my Facebook page, The Divine is Within Us. Or as you mentioned earlier, the www.thedivineiswithinus.com. But I'm leading vision quests in the desert there in the most beautiful part of nature where people can come and spend time away from all the craziness of life, the busyness, and sit down in amidst the boulders and the beauty of the desert and begin to think about all these things that you and I have been talking about, the kingdom within. Me? How do I find that? How do I know it? How do I find the deepest purpose in my life that I've yet known? That's what the vision quests are all about. Okay. Now, so you're going to deal a whole lot then with people's um, souls versus their egos. Exactly. I've had to deal with my own first, and I still it still gives me trouble once in a while. But I'm I'm working on it, and <laughs> so the best thing I can say is I'm still learning. Won't you join me? Uh, I don't want anybody following me. I don't know enough, <laughs> and I, <laughs> so that's where I'm at. <laughs> Well, now, you're going to lead a vision quest, yet you don't want nobody following you. <laughs> That's right. It's their vision quest. I will give them some guidelines and some some input, but it's their quest. It's their life. The divine is within them, and I will cheer them on. Yes. Yes. You know, I was talking to somebody, oh, two or three or four days ago, on the air. We were interviewing about something similar to this. And we were talking then about Vision Quest. Mm -hmm. or we weren't calling it Vision Quest, but we were talking about like walkabouts, like the one on Babylon 5 the doctor took. Uh, sure. But it's basically about getting out there in nature, getting away from all the doctrine and all the hype and problems and everything else, and just going out on a walk, for example, until you catch up with yourself. Yes. Yeah, I like that. That's a great way to put it. And when we catch up with ourselves, who are we? And, and when you we... find that out, that's when you find the kingdom of God. That's exactly right. Who are we? Jesus said, well, go back to Luke eleven thirty five. When <laughs> the English doesn't make any sense at all, but this is what I'm dealing with in the, the vision quest, where the English says something about the lamp of the body is the eye. I remember reading, I said, what in the world does that mean? It makes no sense at all. And then the next part says, be careful that your light does not become darkened. Well, okay, I know how the church distorted that one too. But I, so I looked it up in the Aramaic, and I said, well, oh, my goodness. The lamp of the body is the eye. The Aramaic word for the eye is the, the nafsha, N-A-P-H-S-H-A, the nafsha, which is the most complex Aramaic word of, of all, and it's it's probably the the one Aramaic word that that defies uh, a complete definition, but it's all the person. The the eye is every part of the human body, mind, soul, spirit, emotions, decisions, choices, all these things. So what is he saying? The lamp of the body is your essence. Well, the lamp. When Jesus said, "I am the light of the world." You are the light of the world. The light is always the divinity shining. So what he said was the divine light, the divine within you is your light. That light, the divinity, that is your essence. Or well, the part of you which is good or the part of you that's in contact with God. It's you. It's, it's within you. You are a living representation of the divine. So... In the vision course, we talk about letting go of attachments, um, which, oh, that's, that's a constant thing. Things that we're really attached to instead of knowing who we are, the illusions that we see around us. And so my statement is like something like this. When we come to see beyond all that's in this temporary three-dimensional world, we will begin to remember that high above the earth, we were given birth in love. You're talking about in a different realm? 
Yeah, well, and but coming to the earth. You yeah. talked about reincarnation earlier. and Okay. So we came here this last time, but that birthing happened high above the earth as we came to be a human being once again on this planet to learn, to celebrate our mistakes, to celebrate each other, to become all that we've come here to be. We are much more than a physical body. We're so the to- uh, Arabic uh, rendition supports reincarnation? It does in many ways, yes. Yes. Yeah. We are here to know the deepest purpose for coming to the planet. And no one can do that for us. We have to do that you know, ourselves. You can't do that in one lifetime, especially not in a uh, world full of deception. Yeah. So it's it's just so beautiful when we when I when I realize finally, wait a minute, this life is not all there is. This lifetime so there's nothing nothing to this idea of wasting a lifetime, no matter who it is. Who am I to judge that? I'm here. I'm responsible for me. And I want to step into learning how to love self, neighbors, enemies, stepping into unconditional love, to, to live a life of gratitude. Of, I, this is one of the most beautiful parts of my whole life, is learning to, to walk in gratitude that opens the flowing into you know, divine connection. So I'm here. You're here. Everybody listening, you're here. Why are you here? Do you remember? And I don't, not yet anyway. I'm pretty sure you do by now, though. <laughs> well, I'm working on it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're all beautiful. We are all magnificent. We are all far, far more than we've ever been taught. We're not small. We're not, we don't deserve punishment. We deserve celebration. We're the divine in human form. So that's why Jesus said, let's love one another. You know, that's the funny thing about everything that's going down. The people that are doing the punishing, they really believe the other people deserve the punishment because they're thoroughly indoctrinated into theology. They're projecting their own stuff onto other people. I deserve punishment, and I know it, so I'm going to make you the guilty one. (laughs) I don't think you recognize that on a conscious level, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> well, That's, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say we're supposed to uh, be over here at about three more minutes. I've been g- talking. I usually get close to the end of a show, and I ask if there's anything that you want to cover I didn't think to ask about. Um, so I guess I'll ask you that now. <laughs> well, there's so many things, Royce. I mean, I have... I have just thoroughly enjoyed so much studying and reading and, and one of the most delightful things that I have found, this is part of my 10 volume series that, uh, that I'm writing and we'll have the last one finished very soon. But, uh, the last one is called, uh, Finding the Gifts in Pain and Suffering. But there's another one that I wrote, uh, based on an, an ancient Middle Eastern text called Thunder Speaks. Um, and it's the voice of the, the ancient divine feminine. And I love it because, well, the name of the book is Letting Go of All Illusions, The End of Guilt, Shame, and Remorse. And it's about learning how to celebrate who we are, celebrating our mistakes. She says in there, you know, the words like, you know, you who are struggling in your, in, in, in being rejected and, and, and shamed, she said, come to me. For I am the shamed one, and I am the shameless one. But come, step into your shame, and take my hand. You will find me there in your shame, and together we will walk to higher ground. I love it, and it's just the beautiful way of seeing our humanity. It's also, at least in my way of thinking, a uh, key to finding either to be a divine within you until you can actually look at your own shame and at yourself you can't really see who you are and who you have been and and where it separates in other words exactly yeah, and she says i am all these i am all these things, all these opposites the whole text of thunder speaks is about i am this and i'm that you know i'm the mother of many children and i'm the barren one i am the shamed one and i am the holy one on and on and on and what she's saying is we all have these opposites within us so let's embrace all opposites and let's celebrate each other Let's support each other in our birthing a new self, and let's just celebrate our mistakes and be real together as we walk on this path all the way back home. Okay. Now, 
Was there any last minute thoughts you wanted to throw out there? Well, just to everyone who may be listening, please understand that you are far more than anyone has ever let you be. You are the divine in human form. Go to my website, check those things out, read what I've written there for you. Uh, my book, Jesus Was Not a Christian, is on Amazon. Uh, there, and on my my website, uh, thedivineiswithinus.com, you'll find some of the books that I've written. And if I can be of any help, if I can encourage you, send me a message from on the website or on the Facebook page, which is The Divine Is Within Us. And... Or even go to my email if you want, Jim Stacy S T A C E Y, seven 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 at Gmail. I would be glad to talk with you, share with you. If I can encourage you, that's why I'm here. Bless you on your path because it's far more beautiful than we've known. And if you like the books after you get them and you finish them, feel free to share them. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, two of the books on the face on the website is uh, number one, the Divine Within, the Quest for Spiritual Identity, and the second one is the Spiritual Path of Experiencing the Divine Within. So it starts there, and you can find some more. Alrighty. Now, one last thing I wanted to touch bases on for the listeners out there is when you hear people talk about Christians, they tell you to be Christ-like. And in all honesty, you can't be Christ-like without being filled with the Holy Spirit, since the uh, Christ actually means the anointing. So when you see Christians out there talking about Christ-like, exhibiting bigotry, you can be pretty well rest assured they believe they're being Christians, but in their heart, they're really not. They may be Christian, but they're not following what Jesus taught, is the way I like to say it. (laughs) Well, in other words, they're not anointed or not filled with the Spirit. They're not, you know, in key or in sync, in other words. There's I, I say it that way because I don't believe they know that they're really doing it, in other words, at least not consciously. Yeah, I agree. And we're all unconscious in some ways, so we need to join with each other and learn, laugh and grow together and become. <laughs> yep, and that's what we all put here uh, together for. Otherwise, he could have just stopped with Adam and Eve. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well... Folks, don't forget to come back here. When I say not here, my next show is going to be at Revolution Radio this coming Thursday. I'm going to be talking to Mark Gibbs and his books, The uh, Final Deception. And he goes back into the history of the ancient Israelites and uh, the shepherd kings. And he uncovers a whole lot that he thinks has led us to where we're, how we got in this deceived world that we're into today. I read his book. I thought it was fascinating. I really enjoyed the read. Uh, I know it's not really basically for everybody because um, it also deals with prophecy, and some people kind of lose interest. They they don't find that part of it exactly interesting, but you know some people do. But it's a very informative book. I think y'all, if you are interested in you know what really happened in the past, what's going on now, how we're getting where we're at, I think it's a good place to start. So that's going to be over at www.freedomslips.com. When you uh, get to the page, you click click on the chat room link. That'll take you to a page where you choose a background. And a dialogue will pop up asking for a username. You just put any name in there you want to use temporarily. You don't need a password unless you want to reserve that name for future reference. And on the chat page at the bottom, there's three players. My studio or its player is the one on the left. If you want to click on that and catch the show over there live, that's a lot of directions, but that's the only way to get there. And the one thing I would recommend to everybody is to come to that in Firefox or Chrome or Opera because it, the uh, chat room does not work well in Internet Explorer over there. So I just thought I'd throw that one out there and enjoy, I hope you boys, I mean, you people come over there and enjoy the show with us. And um, Jim, it's been a pleasure having you. I'd love to have you back here again in the future sometime if you want to stay in touch. I'd love to. There's so much more to cover. So, yes, thank you so much for this opportunity, and bless you on your path, too. Well, I tell you, uh, Jim, uh, if you think you got a couple hours worth of material or if I can find a person to fill the hour you can't, I could line you up a show over that revolution, but i got to cover two hours for uh, 
You know, that's how big my segment is over there, in other words. Mm-hmm. I could easily do it. In fact, I can talk all day long. And so, <laughs> so, But there's so many more things and much to develop from everything we've said today. So I would love to if that somebody would like to do that. Okay. Well, I'll get back in touch with you after I get a chance to look at the schedule. I've got some people on hold that haven't confirmed the uh, dates I sent out yet, and I don't want to get too far ahead and get confused because I've given dates away by mistake. Oh, I understand. No problem. (laughs) (laughs) So, everybody, until then, y'all have a good weekend, what's left of it, and we'll catch up with you later. And I'm going to say bye-bye for now. Thank you for listening.